This study is part 5 of Revelation 16, titled Jacob's Time of Trouble. Revelation 16, 14 to 16 reads, Gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The Great Controversy book, page 619, elaborates, Though God's people will be su surrounded by enemies who are bent upon their destruction, yet the anguish which they suffer is not the dread of persecution for the truth's sake. They fear that every sin has not been repented of, and that though through some fault in themselves, they shall fail to realize the fulfillment of the Savior's promise. So God's people will not dread persecution during Jacob's time of trouble, but they will agonize over whether they have an unconfessed sin. It's too late. Too late. Too late. What if I waited too long to, to change things, change me? What if I waited too long? Get a grip on it, would you, Alex? You're not the only one here, you know. For starters, you never changed anything. You're a Christian, right? So who do you believe in? A time of trouble, such as the earth has never seen or known, is just ahead of us. Are we ready for it? Are we prepared? Have we placed our trust in Christ? And do we believe in him as the savior of our souls? Nothing else will soon matter. In this study, we're gonna to try to find an answer to the question. God is a God of love, so why does he, during Jacob's time of trouble, make the saved anguish over the fear of an unrepented sin when they're already sealed? So this will be the focus of what we're trying to answer in this particular study. To do that, we need to put it in rewind a bit and remind ourselves of some building blocks up to this point. In the previous study, we delved into what was the Battle of Armageddon. It seems from our study that the Battle of Armageddon is not a physical battle at a physical location of Har Megiddo. But Jesus was revealing to John, as recorded in the book of Revelation, what the final battle would be like prior to Jesus' return, the battle between good and evil and how God will rescue his people. We concluded that the Battle of Armageddon is symbolic of the final battle during Jacob's time of trouble. If you missed that or would like to review it, it's available on the website, preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. It's part 68. And we started last time by me uh, paraphrasing our key scriptures. And so here, the, here they are, Revelation 16, 12. And the sixth angel will execute the sixth of the seven plagues. It will dry up any connection the wicked may have had with God, leaving them without the power and the protection of God. This will especially target those false religion prosperity preachers and from profiting at the expense of others' eternal lives. Spiritualism will be the most convincing and destructive tool to be used by Satan and the papal system and the pro apostate Protestantism in America. Satan, the papal system, and apostate Protestantism will use supernatural miracles and manifestations to deceive the whole world 
in preparation for the final showdown between good and evil. America's Protestants will give allegiance to Rome's false Sabbath through a national Sunday law. Satan will impersonate Christ's second coming and set up his throne in the third kingdom in Jerusalem, third temple in Jerusalem. The Pope will convince the world that Satan is the returned Christ. They will use supernatural miracles and manifestations to convince the whole world to issue a universal death decree. But Jesus promises, if we're faithful, that he will rescue us from Satan and the final showdown between good and evil, the Battle of Armageddon, Jacob's Time of Trouble. That is the study that we did in Part 65, if you missed it, preparing for the time of trouble.com. With God being a God of love, if the seven last plagues are simply the four angels letting go of the winds of strife and simply allowing Satan to have free reign, then what is meant by God, quote, putting on his garments of vengeance? The Bible says in Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So why the seven last plagues? Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 208 says, They have overrun the limits of grace, they the wicked, and therefore God must intervene and vindicate his honor. So one reason why the seven last plagues is God must vindicate his own honor. Ecclesiastes 8, 10 to 12 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil an hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well within them that fear God, which fear before him. So while God is patient with sinners, he will take care of things in the end for those who fear God. Revelation 16, 5 and 6 says, Thou art righteous, O Lord, thou art and wast, and shall be, because thou hast judged us thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So one of the reasons for the seven last plagues is God's judgments are on false religion because they shed the blood of innocent Christians, saints, and prophets. This we covered in part 66, why the seven last plagues and preparing for the time of trouble.com. But even the favor of God does not exclude his people from suffering. Jesus warned his followers that before the crown, there will always be a cross. Christ clearly stated that if they have persecuted him, they will persecute his children also, saying, a servant is not greater than his master. Suffering for Christ is a trust that has been given throughout history and this trust will continue to the close of time. As long as Satan exists, this enemy of God and humanity will work through his agencies to torment and afflict those whom God has chosen to be heirs of the kingdom of grace. Great Controversy, page 263, says the wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short, and his work of deceit and destruction will reach its culmination in the time of trouble. So Satan's ultimate work of deception will be during Jacob's time of trouble. Great Controversy 6, 27 and 28. When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, and we know that's the close of probation, Daniel 12, 1, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark will be poured out. The plagues upon Egypt when God was about to deliver Israel, were similar in character to those more terrible and extensive judgments which are to follow upon the world just before the final deliverance of God's people. So the seven last plagues are going to affect the wicked and not the 144,000. These plagues are not universal, or the inhabitants of the world would be wholly cut off, page 628. Unlike the plagues of Egypt, the seven last plagues can't be universal or they would kill almost all humanity. Page 629, all the judgments upon men prior to the close of probation 
have been mingled with mercy. The pleading blood of Christ has shielded the sinner from receiving the full measure of his guilt. But in the final judgment, after the close of probation, wrath is poured out without mercy, unmixed with mercy. The seven last plagues are the full measure of the sinner's guilt poured out without mercy. Early Writings, page 64 and 65, the last the seven last plagues will soon be poured out. His anger, God, has was dreadful and terrible, and if he could stretch forth his hand, let me read that again, if he should stretch forth his hand or lift it in anger, the inhabitants of the world would be as though they had never been and would suffer from incurable sores, withering plagues that would come upon them, and they would find no deliverance but be destroyed by them. So God does not do this out of anger. If God lifted his, his hand in the seven last plagues in anger, it would kill all the, all the sinners. Matthew 24, 21 and 22, Jesus said, And then shall there be a great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So Jacob's time of trouble will not be very long because of God's mercy. In part 15 at preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com, we studied um, the, the end of a series of studies of Daniel 12, which is part 7 through 12, and it built up to number 12, which was addressing the question, how long will these things be? Which is a question that Daniel asked when he was having this vision. And we analyzed the answer that was given from heaven to Daniel about how long would these things be. And one of the possible conclusions was that the little time of trouble, which starts with the Sunday law and ends with the close of probation, would be three and a half years or 1260 literal days. That the time from the close of probation until there was a death decree for the saints uh, would be 30 days and then 45 days for the rest of the seven last plagues until God announced the day and the hour of Jesus' return. Now, if this timeline is true, then the uh, little time of trouble when you can't buy or sell um, and the Sunday law restrictions get more and more intense is going to last three and a half years. You'll remember the Bible verses that we just read talk about that this God will cut these things off short. So Jacob's time of trouble is short, if this time chart is correct. The seven last plagues would last two and a half months, but the, um, the first few plagues, the uh, wicked do not realize that the righteous are not being affected by the plagues. When they finally see that the righteous are not, uh, getting the plagues, then they say, well, it's their fault. Let's get rid of them. Then we'll get rid of the plagues. Thus, they make the death decree. And I believe that's about between plague two and into plague three, near as I can tell. Um, so then the remaining plagues of the seven last plagues are 45 days. And remember, they're not universal. They're here, there, and so forth, because otherwise it would kill everybody. Um, I've said before, uh, w one theologian suggested that the, the seven last plagues um, overlap each other rather than being sequential. So the first plague wouldn't end and the second plague start and the second plague end and the third plague start, but that they overlap. So the first plague would last the whole time. The second time, second plague would start and then it would overlap with the first and so forth. I've not been able to find any proof of that uh, idea. So, wonderful events are soon to open before the world. The end of all things is at hand. The time of trouble is about to come upon the people of God. Then it is that the decree will go forth forbidding those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord to buy or sell, threatening them with punishment and even death if they don't observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath. 
The decree prohibiting the buying and selling is during the little time of trouble, that three and a half year period according to that other chart. Uh, Revelation 20 verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and the judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast nor his image nor received this mark in his forehead or in their hand and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is a very significant Bible verse because it shows that during the little time of trouble when you can't buy or sell because of the mark of the beast, there will be people who will be murdered. They will be literally beheaded. They won't be gas chamber, they won't be electric chair, they will be beheaded. So the modern way to behead somebody is either a sword or a guillotine. So I'm assuming that we're gonna see the guillotine come back into play. Kind of gross to think about, but the facts are it's in the Bible. And it is not talking about the beheadings during the uh, French Revolution. It's not talking about the Dark Ages. It's talking about the mark of the beast. So we know it's talking about the little time of trouble. Great Controversy 627. When Christ ceases his intercession in the sanctuary, the unmingled wrath threatened against those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, Revelation 14, will be poured out. So the plagues start after the close of probation, which is the start of Jacob's time of trouble. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God will do anything he can to save lost sinners, but there is a limit. Desire of Ages 224-225, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Let that sink in. That's a pretty profound statement. So if we could see the end from the beginning, we would be willing to be beheaded in order to see another sinner saved into the kingdom. Great Controversy 634, if the blood of Christ's faithful witnesses were shed at this time, this is talking about the Jacob's time of trouble, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, say during the little time of trouble, be as seed sown to yield a harvest for God. Their fidelity would not be a testimony to convince others to the truth, because probation is already closed, for the opprobate heart has beaten back the, wa the waves of mercy until they return no more. If the righteous were now left to fall prey to their enemies, it would be a triumph for the prince of darkness. Says the psalmist, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide. Again, if the blood of Christ's faithful witnesses were shed at this time, it would not, like the blood of the martyrs, be a seed sown to yield a harvest for God. Their fidelity would not be a testimony to convince others to the truth, for the approbate heart has beaten back the waves of mercy until they return no more. If the righteous, righteous were now left to fall prey to their enemies, it would be a triumph for the prince of darkness. Says the psalmist, in the time of trouble shall he hide me in the, his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. When this time of trouble comes, every case is decided. There's no longer probation, no longer mercy for the impenitent. The seal of the living God is upon his people. This small remnant, unable to defend themselves in the deadly conflict with the powers of the earth that are marshaled by the dragon host, make God their defense. The decree has been passed by the highest earthly authority that they shall, be, they shall worship the beast and receive his mark under pain of persecution and death. So there will be a worldwide death decree during Jacob's time of trouble. Last Day Events 245, I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Christ, Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. And then will come the seven last plagues. So once uh, probation closes during the little time of trouble and we move 
into Jacob's time of trouble, then we're going to have the seven last plagues. These plagues enrage the wicked against the righteous. So notice that the plagues have already started enough that they notice that, that the, the wicked are not being affected. They thought if they had brought the judgments of God upon them, and that if they had rid the earth of us, the plagues would then be stayed. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. So this is the death decree. The death decree is a reaction of the wicked to getting the plagues and noticing that the righteous are not being affected by the plagues. Last day events 234. In the time of trouble, Satan stirs up the wicked and they encircle the people of God to destroy them. But he does not know that the pardon has been written opposite their names in the book, books of heaven. So during Jacob's time of trouble, Satan will not allow, excuse me, Satan will not know that God's people have been sealed. And he'll think there's a chance that he, if he could persecute them and, and place doubt in their minds about their eternal salvation, that they might uh, come over to his side. So this is why we have the uh, afflictions on the righteous. Uh, the trials that are suffered are by two people groups. The first one is the wicked. The second one is those who are saved. So the wicked have the seven last plagues, which, which in this order are the grievous sores, the sea turns to blood, the rivers turn to blood, there's a heat wave, there's darkness, the river Euphrates dries up, and there's a worldwide upheaval. In the meantime, the, the saved, the 144,000, are being persecuted by a death decree to try to get rid of them. Therefore, they flee to the mountains to find protection. The Bible says your munitions will be rock and I'll, I'll save you in the clefts. And they are agonizing over their sins. Though God's people will be surrounded by enemies who have bent on their destruction, yet the anguish, anguish which they suffer is not the dread of persecution for the truth's sake. They're, they're not agonizing over the death decree and having to flee. They fear that every sin has not been repented of and that through some fault in themselves, they will fall, fail to realize the fulfillment of the Savior's promise. They're not agonizing over the persecution. They're agonizing about whether they have an unrepented sin. So then again, the question that we've started this study with, with God being a God of love, why does he make the saved anguish over the fear of an unrepented sin when they're already sealed? Well, if the battle of Armageddon is the final war between good and evil before Jesus comes, then who is waging war on whom? Revelation 12, 7 says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So, we can see from this verse that war in heaven was between Satan and Jesus. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he thus judge and make war. So from this verse, we know that Jesus, in the end times, during this Jacob's time of trouble, he's judging Satan and the wicked, and he is making war against them. God is. Jesus is. Revelation 12, 17, talking about the dark ages, but it applies here too. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. So from this, we understand that Satan continues to be at war, and he's at, at war with anybody that's on God's side. So who is inflicting what on who? We get a glimpse of this uh, in the chapter called Time of Trouble in the book Great Controversy, and I'm going to just hit some bullet points in, in the order in which they happen. Michael stands up. Probation closes. The angels are no longer holding back the winds of strife. Satan now has full control of the lost. Evil angels spread desolation everywhere around the earth. The people of God are plunged into affliction and distress. 
Great Controversy 618. As Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits them to try them, to have him try them to the uttermost. So notice carefully who is doing what to who. Satan is trying the people of God to the uttermost. God isn't doing it. Satan is doing it. We continue the list, number six. Satan tries the people of God to the uttermost. Satan attempts to terrify the saints about their sins. Their anguish is not a fear of the death decree. Their anguish is the fear that they are lost. Many Christians have suffered in prison cells for Christ in times past, and so they will again in the future. Have it your way. The hard way. God's love for his children during this period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. So who is inflicting what on whom? Well, I think we have established clearly that God is inflicting the seven last plagues on the wicked and upon those who uh, have persecuted the saints. But it's Satan who does the death decree and forces the saints to flee to the mountains. But it's also Satan who is making the saints agonize over their sins. If they knew that, they, uh, that it was Satan doing it, then they wouldn't worry about it because they're already sealed. But God is allowing Satan to have full sway and part of him persecuting the Christians is the death decree fleeing to the mountains and most agonizingly agonizing over their sin, wondering if they have an unconfessed sin when in fact they do not. They don't have any unconfessed sin. They're already sealed. They're already saved. And they just don't uh, know it because Satan is is been given permission to persecute the saints. So Satan is the one who's at fault here. It's not God uh, making uh, Christians agonize and wonder if they're saved. It's Satan doing it. It's tempting them to try to get them to swing over to their side of the evil, even though it's they're not going to because they're sealed. So why does God make the saved anguish over the fear of unrepentant sin? God doesn't do it. Satan does it. Jesus promises in Revelation 3.10, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. Isaiah 49.16 says, I have carved your name into the palm of my hands. Psalm 91.8-11 says, A thousand will fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall, sh shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Great Controversy 631 says, Yet the, for the elect's sake the time of trouble will be shortened. God shall not uh, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Luke 18, 7 and 8. The end will come more quickly than men expect. Great Controversy 633. The precious Savior will send help just when we need it. The way to heaven is consecrated by his footprints. Every thorn that wounds our feet, has wounded his. Every cross that we are called to bear, he has borne before us. The Lord permits conflicts to prepare the soul for peace. The time of trouble is a fearful ordeal for God's people, but it is the time for every true believer to look up, and by faith he may see the bow of promise encircling him. Says the psalmist, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide him. Psalm 27, 5. Christ has spoken. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. 
hide thyself, as it were for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquities. Isaiah 26. Glorious will be the deliverance for those who have patiently waited for his coming and whose names are written in the book of life. Revelation 16, 15, and 16 paraphrase, the Lysky paraphrase, God promises, if we're faithful, that he will rescue us from Satan. And in the final showdown between good and evil, the battle of Armageddon.